Hi everybody, welcome to After Chat. This is episode number four. And this week, after we get through some news, we're actually going to talk about why we're insane. And you want to know why we're going to talk about that? Uh, because we were editing episode one where we said there's an entire episode here about how we're insane. And that prompted me to write down episode four. Why we are, in fact, insane. So, I'm Tom Model from Aperture to Pixels. I'm Ryan Peace, also from this area, general vicinity. Yep, yeah, thanks. Peace point talk here. There you go. Uh, so we got a few bits of camera news to get through, and then we're just going to ramble on about why we're crazy people. Uh, the first thing that, that came to my attention this week is that in China, Nikon has been forced to recall all of the D600s. Uh, apparently they have a once a year expose called, uh, programs called 315. It comes out on March 15th every year, which that's fine. Um, and they basically did an expose of all the problems that there were with the D600s, which normally I wouldn't think is huge news because it's China. But the fact that Ryan's camera is in the shop for the exact reason that the Chinese government is forcing them to do a recall, uh, just that's what stuck in my head. Uh, according to Reuters, the Japanese camera company made $1.16 billion in China last year. So it's no surprise that they are taking this very, very seriously and moving very swiftly on it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so and basically, for Nikon, this is a huge PR nightmare. And they could uh, very well have problems with sales in China from here on out if they, if they don't take care of it. Yeah, it's not good. That kind of no. already not. Have, they're doing the right. It's just, it's nothing is good when you talk about it in those terms. But the yeah. 600, well, I mean, they they just handled it. While they handled it well now, it should have been handled this way a year ago. Yeah. As opposed to after the camera discontinued and already lost all its value. So. Yeah, and, it, and, and actually, I, when I was reading through this, it actually reminded me of the, the Toyota recall because it's the mentality of the Japanese companies. They like to have a solution before they come out and admit there's a problem. So it's, I mean, it's just a different mentality than how we have in the U.S. where it's, oh my god, there's a problem, fix it now. You know, tell everybody and then fix it now. It's like, well, when we have something to tell you that, how to fix it, we'll fix it. And so, I mean, but they are fixing it. That, that's the key thing right now, is, is they are fixing it. The full service recall is free shipping both ways, but it then, that's a lot of equipment. It's, yeah. And that, that's part of why we're insane, and we'll, we'll hit on that in a little bit, too. Um, so that, that's one of one of the uh, big news things this week. Yeah, we talked, we talked about this on the podcast. We know Google reduces price of Google Drive storage. Um, physical storage is cheaper and cheaper, but cloud storage is the same way. Cloud storage is excessively more cheaper, more accessible as it happens. You know, everything with the cloud, everything more cloud processing, cloud storage. It's funny watching Jesse try and look at my tripod that's too tall for him at its lowest setting. <laughs> um, so Google completes <laughs> They compete directly with Dropbox. Anyone else to face the planet who does anything at this point. Um, so the new system is, so you, the 15 gigs is still free. It's a dollar, was it a month? For 100 gigs. Yep. $10 a month for a terabyte. Last month for 10 terabytes or more business for business class storage. So that, that spans across your email, your photos, and your Google Drive. Yeah. Drive storage. So we use I use a ton of drive storage. I use a ton of uh, photo storage through my email. There's always these big blocks of photos coming in and out of various shoots. Um, so it's 25 meg file limit. Was reading that quick. Yeah. yeah it looks like. Very good deal. Everything's getting much cheaper. We'll probably end up with at least 100 gigs at some point. Oh, yeah. I mean, need storage for stuff. I mean, I mean, I use the uh, I use Drive right now. I mean, I'm still under 15 gigs, but I'm getting close to running out for just stuff we do for stuff in the studio here, especially the podcast. I keep all of the uh, scripts, all of the documentation, everything we need for for running everything for the for Aperture Chat and all our other videos up there. Wow, uh, a big part of that is being able to share it with you guys, uh, oh, yes. with you and with Jesse and. Uh, if we get anyone else involved with this, the, the sharing feature is what makes that huge because it's a secured share. Google Docs is extremely useful. It's a very powerful business tool for groups. Everything is community. Yeah. Uh, nothing is this little secret of startup stuff. It's just everything in a lot of community and very 
involved, multiple people being involved in the same projects. Yeah. Which Google Doc makes it for you. Oh yeah, it just makes it, it th this broadcast probably wouldn't happen without it, to be honest with you, because even if you guys aren't reading them as often as I am, as I'm writing them, it's a place for me to store everything where I can access it from any computer I go to. I know you guys don't read anything until I print it out and put it in your hands, and then you complain that I put it on paper. Uh, I never complained about it, but I just wonder why we didn't just use all the devices that we have around all the time. Uh, because my Kindle doesn't like Google Drive. Oh, that's true. So. Mine's on Google, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll get a real Google tablet next time. Uh, you know, when my Kindle breaks, which probably will be a long time from now. I broke mine real quick. My, my last about a year before I do something silly and step on them or sit on them. Well, that's because you're stepping on them or sitting on them. Well, back pocket's a bad idea. <laughs> just, you know, just nope, that kills me because the, the original Kindle, like one of the things they did was they showed an ad where people would put it in their back pocket. Well, the paper screen Kindle, you can step on. It's not no, no, it's, no, I've right broken two of them. Uh, how you... I've never broken mine. I've broken two of them. That's why I have a fire and it works great now because I, so I don't you try and put it in my. Screen, print, Kindle? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I've broken two of them. Um, so, uh, I'm in, you know, something personal for me this week, um, since I shoot on a Canon 6D, there was a firmware upgrade came out this week. I found out about it totally by accident. I was actually looking up something on the Canon website and on the 6D page in particular, and it was like, oh, hey, drivers and downloads. And I was like, I was actually looking for. Um, uh, the codec so I could actually look at the raw files right in Windows. And the thing on there, it said, oh, firmware version 114. I was like, oh, sweet. Uh, I, I, that might be what I'm running. I run over, I grab my camera, I look at it, and I'm like, no, 113. And then I could have just saved myself a little trouble and looked because the date on it was the day at I was looking at it. Like it had it literally been released like an hour earlier. So <laughs> it was kind of a, a silly thing for me to go run and grab the camera. Um, no real huge updates in this firmware. Um, they had one small update where people who are running the EOS software on iOS, I know that's a lot of OSs, uh, the, the, because it has built-in Wi-Fi, you can t tether it to your, uh, to your phone or to your network, and there was an update to make it a little more compatible with the iOS software, and then there were some menu language fixes in, uh, hold on, French and Korean. They just had some wording fixes. So otherwise, not really a big deal for me because I don't ta I, I don't tag it to my phone, um, so yeah, I'm living on the bleeding edge. I didn't, the press release came out several hours after I actually installed the update. So if they didn't come out and said, "Oh shit, don't install this update," I would have been screwed. So the so early early releases of this new firmware have seemed to ruin cameras all across. <laughs> That's happened, you know. Oh yeah. There have been like Sony had a PS I think it was PS3 firmware that bricked PS3s and PS4s. So it was a PS4 when it first yeah. came out. They had an accident where they left a firmware that was bad open for like a minute. It was like 30 people downloaded and bricked their new 500 consoles. Yeah. But and, and actually, my, my Apple TV has an issue where I can't on. It's not bricked, but it won't accept any new firmware updates because I happened to. The same thing was like a, a uh, 10 minute window. And they're like, uh, yeah, we haven't figured out how to get that firmware on out. And so every day I turn it on and it goes, hey, there's new firmware. Hey, there was an error updating your firmware. My 600, P600 comes back, it should have nice new firmware in it. Well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Nikon has announced the V3 of their mirrorless cameras, which, while not being fully well received as a mirrorless camera, has been apparently getting better. The V3 people are somewhat excited about because it is 20 frames a second at, was it 18 megapixels? Yep. I believe it is. So it's very, very fast. Compared to its previous, I think it was probably 11 to 12 frames a second with the V2. Yeah. Uh, the V3 comes with the grip package in it, comes with the electronic viewfinder package in it, and at $1,000, $1,200 with the kit lens, I think it's probably $1,000 with the grip. It's an expensive point and shoot, obviously, it's a mirrorless, so it's, yeah. it's an expensive, more enthusiast, old mirrorless, mirrorless camera, but it seems to have the features that people want for enthusiast old mirrorless cameras. Uh, 1080p at 60 frames a second, so you get some nice, smooth, Slow and slowing up time, that kind of stuff. Um, built in Wi Fi, XP4 processing, so it can handle that file, that speed. Um, the kit lens it looks like it's a piece of good piece of glass, 10, 10 to 30 millimeter, 3.5, 5.6, very low aperture. Um, they have this, all of the one suite lenses work, and then they sell, I believe it's about $130, is the F mount converter. So, this is why I would ever purchase one is that you can buy an F mount converter, which has a piece of glass in it, it's an actual converter that will convert your 
20 frames a second real camera into an F mount lens. So I would actually take it, put my 70 to 200 lens on a tripod, and put my 83 up for the back of it and use it as a bottle lens. I think that's because it's such a small sensor, it's cropped, so it'll be a 500 millimeter lens at that point. It could be a good thing. Yeah, you know, that actually, yeah, with the converter, it, I, I hope Canon finally puts out a decent mirrorless in the near future. But, uh, but yeah, being able to, to bring in your SLR lenses to, to run on a, on an MILC is, is huge. Yeah, I mean, it's the next frontier, really. It's, you yeah. Know, that's what you need. But, yeah. I mean, not now, but pretty soon it's going to be the, the standard. Yeah. So that's about all we have for, for news this week. Um, kind of a light news week. We can throw the papers on the floor now. Um, and, and really to get to what we're really here to talk about this week is why we are insane. Because like we talked about in the first episode, we, we made the comment, we could do a whole episode on why it's insane to be a photographer. And really, it just is. Um, there's so many things that, you know, so much time you have to put in, so much energy, so much everything. And you're like, okay, well, that's your job. That, that's fine. That's what you do. But it's, it's beyond that. It's, it absolutely is. The, the field right now in photography is so crowded, it's hard to believe. I mean, we're sitting in front of these cameras because there are enough people who watch and consume photography-based content on YouTube to make that a viable content option. And when that's true, you know there's so many professional and high, high enthusiast level photographers that this kind of content works. You yeah. Know? That's scary. Yeah, and it, it really is kind of scary. That, and the hard part now is getting to be, you know, there's so many people who are out there like, oh, my friend has a DSLR, because DSLRs have come down, you know, in price. You have your entry-level ones, like the Canon Rebels, which I won't knock, because we're using one right here to our, you know, that my, my single shot here is my old Rebel, which still works great for yeah, doing some video. Shots yeah, so the entry-levels are still... $100. Yeah, and, and they're taking good pictures, but... You know, they, but so many people have them now that you like, you know, people are starting to get to the point of it's like, well, why do I need a photographer? My friend has a DSLR. And there's so much more to it than just that. And then that, that could be another episode as to why, why you need that. But why are you insane? Because those people are watching things like this and trying to pick up and trying to, trying to work on it at the same time that we're trying to distinguish ourselves separately from them in order to just kind of say, no, this is why you do want to hire me. And yeah, it's, 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 it's the process of actually making this a, a career choice that's insane. Um, yeah, it's one thing to put a lot of money into camera equipment if you use a hobby and kind of your new your new thing. It's something that you do to have fun. It's another thing entirely to try and make that make money for itself. I I always purchase equipment that is as cost effective as it can be, and so that I can have a chance to have it make it money back. So I bought a D ninety back when D ninety was a good camera, on a thousand dollars. I used that D90 for about 120,000 square clicks. I spent a lot of time working with that. I worked my college newspaper. I worked dozens and dozens of events through a couple of weddings. Once I had a couple of weddings under my belt, yep. we went up. I bought the 6D600, which is a huge jump. And oh, yeah. Lenses. But even then, right now, you can buy a D600 used, D610, refurbished or whatever, for $1,400. When I started photography, a full-frame camera was $3,000. Oh, like, yeah. Anything full-frame to do was extremely expensive. It's not cutting-edge new releases. Yeah. So it's the quality of equipment now is a very big factor in that. Yeah, no, the, and the availability, you know, it, it, uh, of you know that same equipment. There's, you know, there's much more of a used market. Well, I shouldn't say much more of, but a more active used market, a more active refurbished market, which you never really saw much refurbished before. And now you're getting, you know, uh, refurbs out there, which brings the price down to even more reasonable levels for people who are just high-level enthusiasts who are now buying, you know, the 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 beginning end of the pro-grade cameras just because it's in their budget now. And so people, go, oh yeah, well I, I got a friend, he's got a 7D. Well, that's that's great. A 7D is a beautiful camera. I, I, 7D is a professional camera. It's a professional, it's a professional crop camera. Yeah. It's, it has its purpose, but it's, it's, it's great for sports. I mean. Yeah, the yeah, as, as the six, because that's the that's the the first. If you start grading them out, it, it's the lowest of the full frames, but it's still a full frame camera, and it still blows most other cameras, uh, other than the true pro, super high end pro cameras, out of the water. But it, it's a sheer amount of investment to get to that point, and then 
And then, you know, and it's always that, that argument of, well, not an argument. I mean, it's, it's pretty well proven you buy a good lens and, and, and a mediocre body or the other way around. So once you're getting up to these bodies, you already have to have the good, the good glass. So now you're looking at, you know, you're looking at thousands of dollars of investment, you know, up front before you're even, before you're even at the point of being able to go out and say, hey, you should hire me. You know, you're already putting a fair amount into, of your own time, your own money into getting this stuff done. And, you know, if you're, if this is it, this is all you're doing, that's a huge investment to put up front in your own skill that you don't know if there's going to be a payoff. Yeah, it's, it's like any, I mean, any small business has a thrift. And if, yep. when you're investing in yourself to start doing this kind of work, and you're competing against so many people who already are stable of their own means, especially, yeah. that's very extremely difficult. It's, it requires distinguishing yourself. In a way, um, I'm glad that we have the community that we do. We, we know enough photographers. We, we've shot with enough people at this point as I have to know people's styles and to know that we're all different. Yep. Everybody is so different in their style that people hire who they like their photos. It's really what it comes down to is that you can't get, you have to develop your style to a point that it's the peak of what it is. It's you keep your style and just. Like this, this is an article that somebody said the other day. Stop trying to get everyone to like your work. It's you do what you do, keep doing it well, and eventually people who like that work the same way you do will find you. Yep, that's, that's, that's true. Any kind of style that I've seen through the web, it's people who like that style of work will find that photographer. Especially in the age of all the social media, Pinterest, especially, people know enough and find enough information about photography to find the photographer they want to do the web. They will find the person that has the style that they want, that has this, the portfolio, portfolio to match what they need to do. You have to really put yourself out there in a good light to get work done. It takes a lot of effort to yeah. really get work done. Yeah, it's, it's like the guy from uh, TattooedBride.com. I can't remember what the photographer's name is off the top of my head now, but I wish I had written it down. But it, that's all he does. That's his whole portfolio. He does weddings for the you know, the tattooed and pierced bride and groom, and that, that's what he does. That's his whole livelihood. And basically, I mean, you'll go to like a tattoo convention, you know, like we have the one here in Providence every year, and you'll see all these tattoo artists and all this stuff, and then one photographer. And that's where he makes most of his, most of his contacts for, and, and these people hire him not just to do weddings, but also do like family portraits and things because they're comfortable with him. And they like his style because it's a darker, it's a, it's, I, I, I love his galleries there. They're a little darker, they're a little, you know, they're not that bright, happy picture that everybody always gets. They, they get a lot of, you know, he gets a lot of very interesting shots that, you know, most photographers wouldn't go with, but the people who are hiring him, they like that work. Yeah. And so that, that's what's key there. Is, Let's like our friend Matt Norris. Yeah. Uh, MG Norris, contemporary photography. How many times have we mentioned him now? Uh, uh, yeah. Well, he deserves it. It's, oh yeah, no, he's really good. His work is extremely good, and his if he could prefer work, his, his preferred line of work is like steampunk and more nerdy kind of all wedding, and that works. He does that super well. He does his steampunk and his character portrait photography is amazing. Oh yeah, he travels a lot. He has connections in the region, and his stuff it warrants being paid more than he probably gets. But he does he makes a living this. It's his work is extremely good, and that's, it's scary to venture yourself. It's scary to make something be your specialty. Yeah. But that's really what it takes now. Yeah, that's you all, you, you pretty much, much have to at this point. A lot of people struggle with that. That's what I'm struggling with now, is you have to make an entry yourself. Yeah. Or else you just don't do anything. You yeah. can't just do everything. No, it, it, it doesn't it, work. You get drowned. It doesn't, you just do nothing in that case. Like, you know, so I've, I've had people come up to me and ask me about weddings, and, you know, I, don't shoot. I mean, I shoot weddings, but I don't. I don't primary shoot weddings. I always, I refer them all to you because yeah. I'm like, no, no, no. You want a guy who's, who shoots weddings? I will gladly be there. I'll be taking pictures. I'll be helping them out. But this is the guy who shoots weddings. I shoot portraits. I mean, that, that's what I. That's what I do. Um, Even me. I mean, I've been shooting second shooting weddings for two years now. I've had a solid two years of second shooting wedding, and now I'm starting to take one, two, three, or four primary weddings. Yep. Yeah. And. People who have that level of experience, there's less of. It's having the experience, being able to say that, that you've shot 50 weddings. Having shot 50 weddings in some way, shape, or form, that way, is a big deal compared to oh, a lot of people 
huge. Every time I hear that, that's why I get the comments I do. Because I, I live at Weddings. I have all my Saturdays in June, May, most of August are yep, Weddings. Yeah. yeah, you pretty much have no weekends in the summer. No Saturdays, especially. Yeah. So people have your weddings on other days. Give the man a weekend. I, I had a, a <laughs> My cousin just got married on Thursday. I shot his wedding for free, basically, because it was a Thursday. And it was fun. That's yeah. Like Thursday wedding. Yeah, there you go. And, and that, that becomes. And, 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 yeah, you know, it's, it's the time, and people think, oh, well, you know. You take a picture and you're done. And no, God no. God no. Why are we insane? Because we do so much work that people never even see, and they just take for granted. And it doesn't matter how much you try and explain to people. You know, no, you don't understand. For every hour I'm here taking pictures, there's two or three hours of that time just going through them, editing them, finding you know, taking out the bad ones, making the good ones even better. Like it's. It's yeah, not just the time you're standing there talking to the person. It's infrastructure, it's, your, it's everything, it's your life, that's the issue. Yeah. When you make $2,500, $3,000 in a day, that's sometimes it helps people to wrap their heads around. And enough people, there are plenty of people who get, who don't understand what that is. That's a problem, you know. That's why you want to find at least back to you, right? try and price yourself out of the people who don't understand what you're paying for and get for part of it. Yeah. And that it's difficult, but it has to happen. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually, uh, you know, and, and you know, part of it is marketing and selling yourself. I actually, have, when I first started charging people, I was way underselling myself, mostly because I didn't know what I could get away with charging. And then I did a job, you know, I, I had a shoot uh, just before Christmas last year where there was a family that, you know, I mean, they were friends of mine from, from high school who I hadn't actually seen in years, and, and she me down and I said, well, yeah, but you know, I was trying to, at the time I was trying to ramp up my prices and see what I could get to, and I asked for a price and they, and they said yes right away, and as soon as that happened, I was like, I'm actually underselling myself drastically if they're like, oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Do that or they just had money to burn and they didn't care, but. It's, it's all in your field, too. It's very, yeah. it's very beautiful, and then the wedding photographer field is especially um, um, being, being someone who starts at 1850 is sort of middle of the road in my eyes. That's low in the middle of the road, 1850 to two grand for one photographer shooting me and a second photographer shooting and helping. Yeah. If you want two dedicated photographers, you should really be looking at $2,500 like just to start for a package that doesn't contain a lot of spend. You know, a lot of prints, a lot of, you can get some prints or you can get not an album. Albums nowadays are so expensive to produce. Oh, yeah. I work, I work for a photographer doing second shooting quite often, and he spends $500 on album. Oh, yeah. Easy. If you charge, if you charge $2,300 for a wedding with an album that costs you $400, you're just, you're just, you're just, you're not sure, because that's, you're not making anywhere near enough money to spend the 30 hours that you're going to spend having that wedding, the 30 hours you're going to spend shooting and traveling and for two people. Oh, yeah. It's, it's tough. Yeah, it's, it's really tough. And... You know, and going right along with that, it's again, it's, it's all about marketing yourself and getting that money. I mean, you have to have the confidence to ask for that money and be willing to walk away when they say no. And you know, that's a lot. That is a whole different mindset than what a lot of people have. Is you know, that ability to walk away and say no and just be like, no, this is this is what I get for this. Um, you know, maybe you negotiate a little bit, you know, but not. You, you have to be you have to be ready to say no. This is what I get. This is my rate. And if you don't like it, then, then the magical beer comes in from the side. Uh, if you if you you have to be willing to say this is my rate. This is what I get. And that is nerve wracking. That really does require a level of insanity to be able to say to be able to say no to someone who's coming to you asking for something. So a big part of the whole, this is why we're crazy, is where we're sitting. At our Ricky so, table. well, Tom, Tom here decided at some point, about six months ago, more than that. More than that now. We've been in the room eight, six months now, eight, seven months now. I was looking at the. Yeah. So we've been in this room since so that's what the middle of August we started doing stuff now. Yeah. So it's all we're we're coming up on a year at some point, which should be fun. Um. 
We're sitting in a studio space that was purchased for two people who don't aren't really sustaining themselves in photography and meant to. Like it's one of those things that we're, we're both looking to make money with photography. And the insane part is having space to do it. So Yeah, we, you talk about it and, and having to make a commitment. We committed to twelve months of a space that might just be money thrown out the window if if we don't make any money. Yeah, it's the old, the old adage is that you wait until you absolutely need space. So you wait and wait and wait, keep waiting, keep making money until you absolutely need space, and then you wait a year, and then you go find the studio space. Kind of did the opposite. Yep. Yeah. In a lot of ways. It, actually, a lot of ways. What? It's everyone has their own situation. So doing what you can to make yourself more efficient, what you do to make yourself more better, well known, to make yourself do what you do better, especially, yeah. it's usually worth the investment. It's worth, if you're willing to put your time to put yourself forward, it's worth the investment monetarily for whatever you're looking at, whether it's glass, whether it's a body, whether it's space to be in. It's, yeah. Now, I, I have a day job. That's the only reason that, that this is even a thing is, and that, is trying to do this and have a day job, that's its own level of insanity. I mean, that is, I, I easily, you know, I, I spend 50, 60 hours a week at work, and then I spend another easily 30, 40 hours a week working on not talking to stuff. Okay, I maybe spend 10 of those hours playing Minecraft. Yeah. But you, have to. It's, it's, it, you can't just stare yeah, and look yeah. at pictures constantly no. for 10 hours at a time. I mean, I, I do jump on and play Minecraft for a little bit. I won't deny that. No. I don't charge people for my time playing Minecraft, but it happens. But the fact that now I've basically taken out any chance of having a real social life because I'm here every night and most of the weekend, and I'm at work the rest of the time. And if it wasn't for some really good friends who like to drink beer, I probably wouldn't have much of a social life. By the way, we're drinking Eric Hansen. They are not a sponsor yet, but we're working on that. There he is. It. You know, beer. Beer. Um, beer from Rhode Island. Yeah. Well, beer from I mean, New York. Photography as a whole, being a professional photographer ever in history, was always about having weird hours and working way too much for not a lot of money. Yeah. That's always that's the stereotype. It's true. It's what it is. Oh yeah. Nowadays, it's you're working just as hard, but depending what section you're in, it's um, it's even harder. Like I, especially the person I work for, is Tom Valentino. I work I work with him quite a bit. He was a professional photographer, a commercial photographer in Rhode Island in the 80s. And in the 80s, he was making six figures doing 8x10 large format commercial grade photography in a giant studio with 10 bays and this gigantic, ridiculous thing. And when he saw the writing on the wall at that time, it's, he knew things were going to change. He knew he moved ahead of it. But it turns into what it is now is that he, he worked with his family at the wedding. And that's where money is. That's it was where he ended up, but it's still, it's hard to make ends meet doing this. Oh, yeah. As a general rule, it's... Yeah, you, it, it, it's not quite entirely feast or famine, but the ones who make good money doing it, they make really good money doing it, but that's because they've got long-term contracts with, you know, a magazine or and even that's disappearing as they go to yeah. more freelance. Right. So you, you, it's a field where there's so much competition and it's so easy to... The barrier to entry is so low now that it's it, you, you have to either truly love it or have something wrong chemically in your brain to want to do this. I mean, that's really the two options you have, and then that, that explains why we're insane. Because for me, it's something I truly love doing. I love taking portraits. I love taking pictures of people, and I also like hiking around with my camera. But yeah, if it wasn't fun for us to do, even in the most stressful times, I would do it. Yeah, it's, you, even you can't. Weddings, I'm walking around kind of whistling and not actually stressed out. I've, I've seen you do it. It's, it's, I don't know how people do this and don't stress about it. I would never do this if that was stressful to me. That's yeah. insane. That's even more insane if people do this and are unhappy about it. I, yeah. I mean, I, I get it if you're a doctor or a lawyer and you're making six, seven figures and you don't like your job but you like the lifestyle it gives you, you're not going to have that taken pictures. You have, you have to have enjoy it. Well, I, that's that's the, the real barrier to the real barrier to being more is that 
you can do whatever you want. It's about yeah. doing as much as you want to do. I mean, I'd, I'd love to be out shooting every day if I could, but right now, again, day job gets in the way. Well, that's, you don't want to be relying on this. No. Oh, well, I do want to be. Eventually, I would love to be relying on There's this. The difference is that you don't want to have to be relying on this. You no. want it to already just be there. Yeah. Once it's already there, relying on it just fine. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sure there's what about an hour of battling crazily. I wish we set up mics in here for when we are just talking, like in the in the you know late in the evening. Someday and... there'll be a feed that you can kind of watch, like a little dribble game. What a random shit we've done here is just wow. insane. But well, that, that's the whole point of the one of the other channels that we're doing, the Bucket Castle Labs, is just to put up the random stupid stuff we yeah, do in here. I guess I do more of that stuff. That's fun. But, yeah, that, that's usually 3 a.m. and having stuff in the day and a half. And it's quiet in the castle and we do things. I do things. Yeah, you do things. I'm at home. I think I go to work a couple yeah. hours after that job. Yeah. So, yeah. Although, I have to admit, the fun thing this week was walking into Hunt's video, Hunt photo and video with $1,800 bills in my hands and going, <laughs> sell me a lens. <laughs> so, I have this problem with hurting my back. I don't want <laughs> they take out money for something that you know you need, and then you're happy and you walk out. Yeah, I, I, I actually stopped back in yesterday to because we needed more. I needed more micro gaff, so I picked up a, a, and Paul was there, but I didn't get to talk to him. He was, he was uh, Paul. Paul's the sales guy I usually deal with, but he was helping someone else out. And one of the uh, one of the other guys who was there when I bought the lens, he was like, "All right, is there anything else you want to stay?" I'm like. No, you've taken it off of my money this week. Oh. Stop taking my money. <laughs> I have not pictures of myself. He was laughing. Pictures of myself with just a pile of money in front of me <laughs> on my way to a camera store. It's just, you know, those fun, fun, weird pictures of people with like just lots of hundred dollar bills. I can take those too. It's just, it's never seen again. Yeah. It turned into a big piece of glass and metal that I carry around for a few years. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's... But, but I'm very happy it's recording us right now. I uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a very nice thing. <laughs> it's nice to be able to actually mine's, take the pictures. Mine's over here. Yours is over there, mine's over there, and my other one's over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, but it's one of those, you know, hold value, it's a decent investment, and it's, you'll have a lot of fun working with it. It's actually do things you couldn't do before. It's still a lot of money, but yeah. it's, it's and, a fair play. And, and, and part of that insanity thing is I take, you know, I take my camera into work, I use it for things there. And people see me walking around with my camera, and they're like, "What? Is, they're like what? 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 Are you? And like they're just flabbergasted when they see like a seventy two hundred lens on because it's a long lens, and you're, yeah. you you could have a you know the eighteen or not eighteen the fifty five two fifty Canon kit lens is like four inches long, and you know my Tamron seventy two hundred is like nine inches long, and they're like, but but what? Yeah, well, that's, that's the 1855. There's a fun the 250 should be in the in the cabinet. There's a fun feeling after a while of buying large purchases that you know you need to make of just not caring really anymore. I don't. When I make a big purchase, by that point I've already done enough research about it. I've already known that I needed it for long enough, and I've already had enough things I couldn't do because I didn't have it. Yeah. That by the time I'm purchasing it, I don't care. I just need the equipment. And it's like, yep, here's all the money, and give myself. Well, I, I, I mean, and when you talk about doing the research, I mean, that alone is time that you are spending. You are, you are spending tons of time doing the research, talking to people, get if you can, getting your hands on the physical lenses, on the physical bodies, and you know, like, like I said, when I went into hunts, the the first day I went in. You know, they didn't have it. In, they, they didn't have the particular lens I wanted in stock. I wanted the Tamron seventy two hundred lens, and they're like, "Well, we can sell you the seventy three hundred, or we can sell you the Sigma version." I'm like, "No, you don't understand. I've done my research. I know which one I want." Now, luckily, they had one that had just been returned, and it was actually in perfect shape because we've gone. I've, I've gone through it. Paul went through it. They had someone else look at it. So three people have looked at it and said, "No, this thing is fine." The person returned it probably because they didn't exchange it for another item. It was probably buyer's remorse is why they returned it. They just said, oh, it's broken. Well, no one could find anything wrong with it. So it, it was probably buyer's remorse on that person's part who probably wasn't buying it because they actually need it to do something. 
they probably bought it because they went, ooh, that looks nice. And so I didn't feel any remorse buying it. It was like, no. And, and the fact that I had to tell them, no, I don't want this one, I don't want that one, because I've taken the time to do the research. And you think, oh, well, that's as simple as looking on a website. It's not. It's not. You, you, it takes a lot of research to determine what you want. Unless, you're, unless you know it's the top-end glass. Like, Which isn't actually a thing. Yeah, because... I mean, you can say it's the top-end glass, but the Nikon new version of the 7200 has downsides that the old one doesn't. Right. And there's every lens like that. The, the field is very thick now with Tamron and Sigma coming out with glass that's just as well-engineered as Nikon or Canon. The, the field is bigger. So yeah. it takes a long time to buy equipment for us. Especially. Yeah. Especially when that's your purchase. You're not... This isn't your secondary lens. This is something someone else is going to use. This is your lens, the only lens that you're going to have. You spend a lot of time looking through stuff. That's why we own a Sigma 24 to 70 DXCG, whatever. HSM. I don't know. It's got lots of letters on it. It's the new Sigma 24 to 70. It's, it's and it's the one lens we both own, but for our various, you know, he's got the Nikon version, I've got the Canon version, but it's the one lens we both own because it is the best lens we could have right now. It's. It has most of the features and most of the quality without the same price tag. And where you can make the distinction and not spend all the money on the name brands in and get most of your return, that's where you don't spend much money. No, I, that's not always true. Like macro macro lenses, I'm going to have to buy my core macro lens. Yeah. You're going to have to buy a macro lens, but that might not be true by the time we get there. You know, it's, it, it might not be. I mean, they just have to be the ones making the, the good macro lenses right now but you know it the old adage is the gear doesn't matter until it matters and when you can look at the field as it exists now at, at 7200 you've got Nikkor you've got Canon you've got Tamron really up there and when you look at the Tamron it's it, it's 95 96 percent of the capability of the Canon lens of, of the new of the new Gen 2 Canon. Canon lens at 60 percent of the price well, until you can, unless you know your the the difference in that is worth it, it's not worth it. That's why I have a Gen One Nikon. Yeah. I don't need a Gen Two. It's, it will work. It does just as well for me. Yeah. And it's will work for another five years until it breaks. Or I, I run a Canon or Sony at that point. Probably Sony. Yeah, well, Sony's. Ooh, that that'll be a fun day when we're all running Sony mirrorless because they're at the front of the pack right now. There. There's obviously tons of crap to trying to talk about. I, it's, but that, that's why we made a podcast about this, so we can talk about it, and you can listen to it. And really, we could go on for another hour or two or three about just how insane, or some people would maybe even call us stupid for even trying this. I wouldn't say stupid, because it's, it's fun, and if nothing else, I'm having fun. But, so yeah, we could go on for another hour, but I think like, this is, seems like a good place to wrap up for yeah, this, this week. Is, this is why it's important when people ask questions. We have no idea what people don't know. We, this is, especially for me, I've been doing nothing about this for like five years now. Since I, I mean, I went to college, I had like an associate's in general studies, just nothing. Um, an associate's degree, I get the hold of it. Mm -hmm. people, I don't know. Um, but while I was there, I worked my, my newspaper, I had a lot of leads, and I bought my first SLR, which turned into whatever the fuck we're doing now. So <laughs> it's one of those, I've lived photography for that long. I, that's all I do. It's like, uh, that, I that's where the phrase, and one thing led to another, comes into play. Yeah, <laughs> and one thing leads to another. And now, we have, now, now we're recording a, a video podcast years later. Uh, but yeah, the, you, know, you don't know what you don't know. And, and more importantly, you don't know what other people don't know. Unless they're idiots, then you just assume they don't know anything. So, yeah, you need to give us questions. Uh, put, them, put them in the comments below. Send us emails. Put them on the Facebook page. Go to aperturechat.com, which now exists. It does. It exists. Um, go over there, read some articles, post some questions, interact with us, because this gets better when we have your input. Otherwise, you're going to be listening to us rant and rave for weeks on end. So I recommend doing a little interaction here. Meh. Meh. Nah. Alright. Well, I mean, you have to do your thing. No, I don't, because I decided not to do that for Aperture Chat. I'm only doing that for my own videos. Alright. So, All right. so have you figured out how you're going to end this, then? 
I just figure it'll be like every other newscast, and Jesse will just fade us out. So, but we'll see you next week, and uh, I don't have time to write an outro yet. Good writer, everybody. Bye.